again, everyone. Welcome to another edition of Alpharetta Tech Talk. I'm John Ray, and we are still virtual, folks. We're not back quite yet in in our inside our studio inside Renaissance Bank, uh, but we still love the folks there. They've done an awesome job with a lot of their clients through uh, a pretty turbulent time, and I know that firsthand uh, in some of the clients that I work with personally. So. Uh, uh, Give them a call. Check them out if you're looking for a better banking relationship. Uh, they are open in the branches, but by appointment only. So you need to make an appointment to go see them uh, at the safe social distance. And But you can go through the drive throughs at any time and do business there as well. Uh, Renaissance Bank, understanding you, member FDIC. And now uh, I'm delighted to welcome Samay Kahili. And Samay is with Gray Orange. And uh, Samay, welcome. Hey, John. Thanks for having me here. It's great to have you. And I am I was excited to learn about your company because you've, you've got a company that is does a lot of work that people don't ne- necessarily expect to hear about in Alpharetta Roswell, right? I mean, it, 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 a lot of technology, but not quite to the extent of where you are, right? Sure, John. It is a surprise that we're making robots down here in Roswell. It, it <laughs> is a, it's an eye-opener for sure. <laughs> for sure. So you're a robotics company, but let's get into it. Tell folks a little bit more about what Gray Orange is all about. So, uh, John, we actually, Grey Orange operates in the supply chain domain. And what we do is we believe we're one of the only companies in the world, right, which brings software and robots built for purpose for order fulfillment, right? And we serve some of the biggest brands uh, which do retail as well as, you know, direct brands and sell, you know, we help in their order fulfillment inside their warehouses, right? So that's, that's what our core business is. Right. And our, you know, our USP is the fact that, you know, because the robot and the robots are built together. Right. So they actually work seamlessly and, you know, and can adapt to, you know, for example, crazy times like we are right now in. Right. So they just, you know, don't take time. You don't have to reprogram them. You don't have to think. They just figure out, hey, demands up. Something's changed. We just need to adapt to it. And they just run seamlessly with that. That's what we do. Now. We'll get into the COVID nineteen problem in just a second because we can't we can't get, talk very long without talking about that, of course. But um, I guess the the crying need that there was for what what your company uh, gives the world is really how Amazon changed expectations for immediacy, right? Yeah. I- John, we call it as two things, right? One is immediacy, which is the speed, right? You expect next day, two day, right? Today, right? So that's Mm -hmm. one. The other one is also the predictability part, right? So it also changed that, you know, you can't say it will be delivered to you up to within the next two to three days. You need to say, hey, it will be delivered to you by evening on the third day or today. or So it's both predictability as well as the speed of immediacy. And both those things have fundamentally, you know, changed our consumer experience and expectations from all the brands, which Amazon set up. So is it fair to say you help companies compete against Amazon? Yeah, it's a, it's a fair uh, you know, judgment to say, right? I think the whether, I would say this though, whether it's compete directly with Amazon or not, it's the user experience, the expectations have been set up. So we, we like saying it that we help them compete with the Amazon effect, right? So uh-huh. the Amazon effect is caused, right? You might be in a direct competition with Amazon, yes or no. That's, you know, that's left to be said, but but the main point is that, you know, Amazon set up some expectations and that's where we call it as everybody's competing with Amazon in the world. And that's kind of that mindset um, you'll be spot on with. We, we help companies, uh, you know, deliver that promise and expectation. Yeah. And it's, it's a customer experience question, yep. right? Okay. So, uh, so t- give a little history. I'm curious how the company started, what, what, what you saw um, that 
got you going? I mean, t- 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 give us a little bit of the early days, if you would. Right. So, John, for us, actually, the early days really started with looking at, like, you know, if we, in some sense, right, we've gotten so used to buying online and, you know, and we, like, you know, it's, like, taken for granted and we do it, right? But if you really look back, right, the concept of just even picking items direct to customer, right, is, you know, is, like, not even 15 years or so old, right? So, and in the in the world of commerce, that's like really short, right? So if you really mm. look at it, 15 years ago or 22 decades ago, nobody was, you know, picking units in niches and, you know, you were going through distribution, master distributors, like it was a whole different, different business, right? So what, you know, what we, we started about eight, nine, eight years ago or so today, right? And at that time, right, it was really, there was a night and day difference between how, supply chains run and how warehouses run for the majority of the people and you know eight years ago amazon just grows every year and hence e-commerce also grows every year so it's really grown a lot over the last eight years Mm -hmm. even eight years ago i would say it was like a upcoming trend and it's like you know it's like two percent of of retail and it's one percent of people's business it wasn't mainstream right so what we were you know me and my co-founder akash were really pulled in with was the fact that we saw a lot of people were concentrating on what we call the front end of the problem, which is how do you make websites? How do you do marketing? How do you actually do direct to consumer? Right. And then there were a lot of people actually, even back then, even though that's not come true today, we're like thinking about, Hey, we're going to 3d print it and we will make everything to consumer. And we thought in between, right. There's this whole supply chain of how do you actually run, get goods from point A to point B right? Distribute them. And, you know, and they're going to go through a massive change, right? Mm. So given that insight, right, we really started on, on supply chain. And, you know, and over, over the years, we've just grown and grown being the, you know, being the first in in the space just helped. And I think we just grew from that. Wow. Awesome story. Uh, So let's talk a little bit about lockdown and how that's really put fulfillment operations in the spotlight. So what are companies, what changes are they going to have to make? Do you see uh, to fulfillment that uh, helps them meet some of the challenges that are going on right now? So, um, John, I'll take, I mean, as you said, right. I mean, I think we can't have any conversation these days without the lockdown and COVID in them. Right. Sure. I'll, I'll just take a, a pause though. Right. I think, let me say one thing that, you know, principally the software platform plus robots that gray orange provides to its customers essentially uh, enables them to be able to handle uncertainty and change in demand spike. Like, you know, what it does is right. Gray matter as a platform, always processes all inputs coming in from various angles, right? I mean, you have traffic conditions, you have order conditions, you have weather, you have everything fed in. And what it enables the operator or the warehouse operator, the supply chain operator to do is basically be able to make sure that the system's going to keep looking at all the parameters and take the best decisions there is, right? This is what is, you know, Grey Matter's core competency, right? Mm. So as a result, when, you know, for example, last Thanksgiving, some of our major customers, what they went through was everybody kind of, I call it as three months before Thanksgiving or or Black Friday, right? Everybody is like, this is what will happen. This is what's going to do, right? Everybody comes up with these plans and prediction. And then I call it Black Friday actually happens. And, you know, and then you have Cyber Monday. And it's, you can say some people get lucky, they get better at predicting, but it's very different than what you planned, right? You can only plan so much, mm-hmm. right? And the main use case for gray matter is at that time being able to say out of the, you know, the platform processes at a customer, a couple of million transactions every second to take the best decision. The reason, you know, I gave you this long background answer was, right? So when you come to COVID, right? I would say that, you know, obviously we are not like, it's not like gray matters built for handling lockdowns in uh, COVID. And, you know, and I hope there's no more, you know, there's not another pandemic for another hundred years. So it's not something it's built for, but it's really built for this uncertainty. Mm. So what happened for our customers were, I call it as literally in one and a half week or close to two weeks from when the, you know, the lockdown started and that they started processing 
Thanksgiving equivalent volumes from mm. their warehouses, right? And they had like, you know, there was no three months to plan for a peak. There was no like, you know, how do you do this? Why don't you put this inventory, remove that inventory? Like, you know, there was no change to actually play a different playbook, right? right. But, you know, I call it touch wood, right? It, you know, it's, it just magically worked for them, right? And there were like, you know, there were learnings to be had in that, but that's what it is really built for because we at Grey Orange strongly believe that, you know, one thing is for certain that, you know, it's just going to keep getting more and more complex, right? More and more technologies will keep coming. Consumers will find, figure out companies, you know, will figure out different ways of, you know, serving to customers and consumers will figure out different ways of consuming, right? Mm -hmm. So you're not going to, it's not going to get any less complex of, it's very simple, you know, you made something to sell this way and you're going to actually sell it that way, right? So given that, right, Green Matters is the platform which actually is helping in that. So given, I think for us, I think trends coming out of this is there's obviously a very strong uh, push towards, you know, automation is obvious, right? I think as, as you know, we all want social distancing, we want to make sure that we can have tight controls on, you know, who interacts with inventory, who interacts with them. But I think the second biggest thing for us is like really flexibility, right? So for a lot of our customers, right, their, their retail channels are shut. Whereas they're online is doing more, for example, right? Mm -hmm. And for them, the flexibility of not deciding, right? This is the automation I put in for online. This is the automation I put in for for retail. This is the one I put for home delivery, right? Mm -hmm. It is the flexibility of saying we don't know what's going to go, right? Which channel? If a you know if a major courier company calls out, you know something happens, they want to move online to to offline, right? So that flexibility is just coming out of this is going to be more and more important uh, is what we are already seeing with uh, most of the interactions we are having with our customers. Um, talk a little bit about the kind of companies that you deal with. Um, I mean, from the early days, it seems like you attracted some pretty good sized clients uh, and enterprise type clients, but uh, give some uh, background on that. So, uh, John, I, uh, you know, I would say I would break like our history into two parts. Let's call it that way. Right. So the early, you know, four, five years or three, four years of it. Right. I think we, since we come from a very strong robotic software background, right. And we pick supply chain for, as you know, I said earlier from a the point of view that there are real problems to be solved in this, right? So, and these are not problems. I like calling it, we didn't want to, you know, we started this after college and we didn't want to go dedicate our lives to solving small problems. We want to really go after the big ones, right? So when we interacted or partnered with some of these clients early on, we were fortunate to find a mindset where we were not really selling. We really wanted to solve big problems, right? And hence, we were much more interested in the problem rather than figuring out like, you know, okay, how do we make money out of this or what do you do? So for being strong product people that we are, right, we concentrate. So early on, the concentration was on finding the right problems. And I think that really worked well. Customers saw that, you know, these people are, you know, research people, like these are business people really interested in the problem, right? I think over the last three, four years, right, Obviously, that has really accelerated forward with a lot of because now we are, you know, as you know, supply chain is a very risk averse industry, right? I, I like saying, you know, uh, nobody gets promoted for doing a good season, but you definitely get fired for doing a bad season, right? <laughs> right. It's such a, you know, it's such an unfortunate truth of our industry, right? So when you look at that over the last three, four years, once we had got these early customers really, you know, Fortune 100 brands and you're working with them, right? We now became the most reliable, right, platform to do, right? Where we we have a thing where we don't generally do pilots or we've not done pilots with any customers, right? We like solving real world problems. So that is what over the last three, four years has, you know, got us today where you have, like, if you go out there and you want to have something which is, you know, uh, I would say cutting edge in the sense that you can go operate in this world, but you have something reliable, running at scale, mission critical, right? So that kind of is our uh, another USP that that's been built over the years. 
Folks, if you just, if you just joined us, we're speaking with uh, Samay Kahili and uh, Kahali. I didn't get that right, Samay. John, the second one was good. I'm Samay Kahuli. But the Holy, second one was better thank than you. the first one. <laughs> thank you. Uh, thanks for giving me a multiple choice there. I'm sorry. But um, no, we're, um, uh, and he's the CEO, founder, co-founder of Gray Orange. Um, you said something there that I find really interesting um, that I think is a cautionary tale, maybe, for other companies. You said you focused on the problem, not the money that was involved in the problem. Tell, say more about that. So, uh, John, what, what for us, the belief has been, right, given, you know, I mean, how big supply chain is, how, you know, big logistics is, right? I think it's very important to solve the right problem rather than concentrate on, you know, I think... We have a very strong philosophy at Grey Orange when we develop both products or interact with our customers of adding value, right? Mm. I, we call it as add value and you will be rewarded, right? That's the right way, you know, to operate, right? So with that philosophy, right, it really comes down to a lot of times we we have what I would like to call healthy debates with our clients on why do you really need to do that, right? Why do you, you know, and that's that's a cultural element of us when we engage with our clients because we look at it as, you know, there is a sense of you can over automate, you can put over technology, which you don't. And we really think that, you know, uh, being the fact that we really like playing the long game, it's not about, you know, stuffing up a warehouse with a lot of robots or selling a lot of technology. It really has to, I call it as ROI is hygiene and making sure that, you know, you actually add some value where they can do more business, right? I mean, none of this should be done to save money. This should be done to make sure at the end of the day, their customers are positively impacted and can get a better experience is kind of the, is the whole, you know, mission that we follow at Grey Orange. And that's kind of what I call it as add value and you'll be rewarded is a better way to operate, right? And build products and build, interact with customers. You, uh, I am fascinated by this because you, and I don't want to get too far down this rat bunny trail, but I think it's really important um, because this sounds uh, suspiciously like uh, you need to be the next uh, case study in uh, uh, Simon Sinek's The Infinite Game because that's that's uh, really what he talks about in that book is, you know, you, you business is an infinite game if you choose to play it that way and the most successful companies do and they're focused on adding value over you know an infinite period of time as opposed to very short term uh you know metrics uh financial metrics that's what i'm hearing uh yeah john we've we've been at that for eight years so still going <laughs> that's that's what we do you're being very modest i could tell that but anyway we'll, <laughs> but uh that's that's why you've been so successful over eight years it sounds like to me is is what you focused on is is the, the value add all the way down the line with both your clients and their clients yeah that's that's you know we we strongly believe that's the way to build a long-term company right i mean this is for us we want to enjoy working with our clients as much as hopefully they will enjoy working with us. And that's, that's core cool to us. Mm. Um, so let's talk about underlying technology, uh, on which, um, uh, your software gray matter is built. Uh, I see the term unconventional choice. So tell us more about what that's all about. So, John, that's that's actually a very interesting, lesser known, you know, I call it stories or secrets of what we did, right? So we did something crazy back in, you know, like six, seven years ago, which is when we were really choosing, right? So I, let me tell you a short story, right? So we, you know, we were coming as, you know, strong robotics people and coming into the space and saying, hey, we want to build, you know, the best software platform there is to enable people to be flexible, right? Mm. And when we did our customer interviews and tried to figure out, okay, what's the, you know, what's the SOP or what should you build or hard code the system or 
uh, you know built into the system everybody kept saying right that it depends right it depends on this situation it depends on a business it depends on you know what time of the year it is right so given right since we kept getting it depend it depend what we said was we needed to build something so flexible at the base right that it can actually it's more a what we call as a computational in, engine right so you should be able to throw a 100000 you know options and you know today we throw a million options at it every second and the system should be able to decide what's the best direction or sop to form right mm. or take right it's like think of it as you know if you have to go pick up you know you want to go outside the house you can go through the back door you can go through the garage you can go through the front door mm-hmm. right but you want to take that decision at that time it's not like every time you have to leave the home you always have to read through the front door right mm. so given given this is what we needed to build we built our system based on a unique language which is actually used a lot of people don't know but almost close to 90% of the world's internet traffic actually runs through a technology which is very similar which is you know is essentially built to route traffic around the world so if you really, and that's kind of the core uh, you know it's built on a language called erlang right and that core what it does for you know fast forward today for supply chain and fulfillment right what it does is you really need to just feed in right that okay this is my this is what i need done and this is how i will measure it these are my cost metrics right mm-hmm. and then right machine learning kicks in ai kicks in and you know and it tries to that at any time it's taking the best decision right mm. now this why i called it at the start a crazy choice we did right because when we started right i would say the first couple of warehouses that we were running we were running probably like 10000 20000 shipments a day right mm. but in terms of platform this was like you know this is built for you know uh, 100000 shipments done right in 10 minutes right so when you look at it how far ahead and we gave like literally two to and a half years to that platform right today of course you know it's a big part of our secret sauce today and you know the ability that we can manage such massive networks of warehouses and operations but that was a very unconventional choice right even today actually companies that are upcoming right now right it takes it's like years and years and you know we're coming up to a decade of investment in in the platform to be able to keep that flexibility and that was our you know crazy choice of you know we were really building it for you know further ahead and even today i would say for the last two years now we've been investing in what we call as being 5 minutes ahead right so we actually meant we are real time now where we take all the decisions real time right but we're actually getting now towards how do you stay 5 minutes ahead of the curve so that's kind of what you know that's we have about close to 300 engineers working on that so that's what keeps them busy wow um so the, the, i kind of skipped right over that um give com- give folks an idea of the size and scope of your company because you're not sure. just here in in the Roswell area no we are in Roswell we are in Boston we are in Japan we are in Europe we are like you know we are in Latin America we are we are pretty global in our in our footprint and presence so we are close to 700 people in the world oh today, wow mhm right so that's this thing and our key markets are of course north america is our biggest market this is where home is right mm-hmm. and then other than that we're spread across western europe and japan are our key markets and we have a fairly sizable development center and r&d center in india also now the other little elephant in the room here i have to get to uh since we're talking about robotics and artificial intelligence uh we have to talk about uh what that does for jobs and how that affects jobs in the future what's what's your perspective there Samay. Uh so John it's a very interesting question you know obviously as you can understand in being in robotics we've you know I've I've had this question with you know business leaders with customers right and obviously you know and in other forums right I think there's first thing let me get tell you something that you know there's a big disparity between you know jobs in the world versus the warehousing 
you know, or the fulfillment job that, you know, people use robots for here, right? What I mean by that is, right, we have warehouses, for example, we have warehouses in Memphis where, you know, they have a 3000% attrition rate, right? Mm. Uh, uh, A person's, you know, average in that warehouse likes working for like average of three weeks or four weeks, right? Mm. So, and so when you look at that insight, right, what it does is, right, today, fulfillment jobs and especially you know order picking specifically right where you have to pick orders either for a store or pick it for uh, customers is like i call it as equivalent to going to a gym right you have to work close to 13 to 14 miles in seven hours right every single day right so and you know and the reason you get those three weeks or four weeks is literally like you know it's like joining the gym back and that's how long the membership lasts Mm. right so given that right what has happened is, right, if you really look at it traditionally, for all the jobs we had on assembly lines and in manufacturing plants here in the States, right, they were very, like, people looked up to those jobs. They were highly repetitive, right? You can be trained, you get better, you get promoted. Like, you know, it's a, it's a very, it's, it's a profession, right? right. And unfortunately, right, in, in supply chain, I'm yet to meet, you know, a, a college going kid saying that I look forward to working in a warehouse for the rest of my life, right? So given that, right, it's it's a job which is a very, you know, it has more, it doesn't have, it not taken as a profession. Now, that was, you know, I know I took a little long-winded route to get here, but what that does is, right, actually in our warehouses, we actually drastically decrease attrition, Right. Because what actually happens and, you know, and I have we have a customer in Latin America, which actually after deploying a massive robotic system, right, was rated highest in in job satisfaction right, oh. by those people. They actually won for the whole country. They were the top ranked fulfillment center for job satisfaction. Oh, right? wow. So in some sense, it's it's actually very different in in how it works, because what happens is the person moves away from, you know, doing like doing hardcore label, it becomes a skilled job, right? They're actually trained, right? They understand and they actually get promoted, run, you know, manage more robots in it. So it's actually in the, and this is specific answer to, you know, fulfillment and the domain we work, right? There, there can be robots out there taking jobs away, right? But I think in the specific industry and space we work, it's more, you know, massively beneficial for, you know, their salaries increase, people do, warehouse managers are much more happier because they have a stable workforce, attrition goes down, right? So that's kind of what the, I call it as a black and white of being outside and in of the warehouse space. That makes a lot of sense. Uh, and, and what, so what you're really talking about is you, you really create, uh, uh, solidify maybe uh, as opposed to create, but uh, careers for folks and uh, as opposed to eliminate jobs per se. I mean, they're positions, but they're not careers. If, if, if you've got that much tr- attrition, correct? Yep, for sure. Right. It's, it's, there's no, and you know, I, John, just I'll add like, you know, companies don't invest in training their people hands because, you know, they're always portable. It's like, it literally becomes the, the relationship is not like, you know, it's more of, you know, a temporary work or something you're doing on the slide versus, you know, you're actually employees of those companies and you build careers over there. Mm-hmm. Right? That, right. It's a very, you know, different view that actually starts. Uh, uh makes sense to me uh um so may we're coming up on on time here and i'm i want to respect your time uh but i've got to ask about the what's next for the fulfillment industry what you see ahead for your company uh as that industry changes so uh john as you know i mean as you've probably covered in some of your other uh, you know talks i do think the lockdown covid in some sense is going to really accelerate, right? The shift towards omni-channel, right? Mm. I, I would say, you know, of course, I won't say just towards e-commerce, but it's going to shift towards omni uh, omni-channel, right? And you'll have to excuse my daughters there in the background now. That's okay. Uh, We're but, used to that, <laughs> right? This environment, right? So, yeah. So, uh, you know, John, what 
is going to happen is this whole mix between two different you know supply chains of do you go to a store do you buy online is really going to shift right mm-hmm. there is there is millions and millions of people and at least billions of people in the world who are experiencing online and different means of uh, you know purchasing for the first time right mm-hmm. that means that you know if if let's call it omni channel supply chain was was relevant and important yesterday right it's kind of survival over the next you know couple of years right that that transition just got accelerated by i mean we believe five years right of adoption mm. so that way i think supply chain is going to become much more streamlined like it will become all one rather than having different and that's what's headed for the industry and i think you know for gray orange i would say apart from you know i would say we'll we'll build amazing products software and robots but i think and the the short story of it is that i think we're going to just want to help our customers in that journey as they do right because these are going to be again uncertain times new challenges new changes how do you change networks you know overnight literally and that's what you know gray orange wants to be a partner in and you would think that the whole issue of uh, social distancing or physical distancing better said is really what we're talking about is um, creates a whole uh, separate bunch of challenges and changes in uh, strategic planning for this industry that did not exist, uh, you know, three or four months ago. For sure, John. And I think it also changes, by the way, like, you know, we just call it about social distancing, but it's also like how, like, if a single person gets affected in a facility, do you shut down the whole facility? Did your, did you just lose, lose your, you know, East Coast network? Because, you know, one person, you know, unfortunately got infected at home, mm-hmm. for example, right? So it changes how people operate, you know, both their network as well as their fulfillment centers. Right. So for sure, I mean, it's, it's, it is different, very different for how um, we come out of this lockdown. And how do you see yourself in the middle of that? I mean, it it sounds like you've built flexibility into your company such that you're able to react to that. I mean, I'm making a statement, but it's really a question. Yeah, no, uh, John, you, you couldn't have said it better, right? I mean, in some sense, right? We are we are built for different scenarios, right? We didn't want to predict the future. We just needed wanted to build the platform that allows you to do this, right? I mean, this is fundamentally fed in and said this is how we want to operate new and you know and we you tweak costs in the platform. It I mean it almost sounds too easy, but it is you know to some degree built for that. We don't need to rethink you know how would the robots work, how would the software work because it's built for this flexibility, right? I mean, if you had what I call as you know rigid automation bolted down to the ground, you are in a very different world today of trying to figure out how do you increase distance? How do people operate? How do you control? Right. But if you are built to something so flexible at the core, right. Uh, it's, uh, it really is. I mean, you still have a lot of problems to solve, but it's not like, it's not written in stone. As I say that, you know, you have to go reinvent the wheel right? it's, it's fairly easy, relatively easy. Let me pick those words. <laughs> Relative, relatively is the key word there, right? Yeah, yes. <laughs> uh, understood. Uh, well, somebody, this has been great. Um, it, it, it's it's a delight to hear your story. And congratulations on your success and and uh, navigating through pretty turbulent times right through here. Um, let's uh, if uh, get some contact information out there for those that have heard something that sparked an interest in your company. Uh, they like to be in touch with you. Tell them how they can do that. Sure, John. John, I always think the best way is to go out to our website. It's www.gray, G-R-E-Y, orange, O-R-A-N-G-E, dot com, right? And that's probably the best way to reach us. You know, there's a form. Let us know what you'll want to talk to us about, and you know, somebody should get back to you. Awesome work. Uh, founder, uh, co-founder, and uh, CEO uh, Same Kohili, 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 sorry about that. Uh, it's been a pleasure having you. Thanks for being with us. Thank you, John. Pleasure is all mine. Thank yeah. So, so, folks, just a quick reminder that you can find our show on all the major podcast platforms. Uh, search Alpharetta Tech Talk 
We're on Apple, Google, Stitcher, uh, Spotify. We're pretty much on all of them. So check us out there and engage with us there. We'd love if you'd subscribe to our show and help support the work we're doing uh, to bring uh, great uh, business leaders like uh, Same uh, to you. Uh, check us out on our website, North Fulton business radio X.com. And you can find our complete archive of shows, uh, not just for Alpharetta tech talk, but North Fulton business radio and a whole stable of shows, uh, there at that website. So for my guest, Samay Kahili, I'm John Ray. Join us next time here on Alpharetta tech talk. <laughs>